are emitted by accelerating a spherical mass distributions. Okay? So a first look at gravitational waves and general relativity. So uh, Einstein actually derived uh, the quadrupole formula in 1918, and he did that by solving the linearized field equations with a source term. And he came up with what would be the amplitude for such, uh, for, for such a wave, and that's the strain H. And it's scaled here in terms of the gravitational constant G, the speed of light to the fourth power in the denominator, R is the distance to the source, and then Q double dot is simply the second time derivative uh, of the uh, uh, moment of inertia of the object. Uh, at, a at a retarded time. And this actually was remarkably uh, successful in that it's accurate for all sources as long as the wavelength is much longer uh, than the source size. Now, Einstein recognized very early on, in, in, in fact, uh, uh, that this was looking hopeless. And he did so because, of course, there's a C to the fourth in the denominator, and that makes H a very small number. R is distance to the source. That's not going to help any in the denominator either. And so Einstein was pretty dejected about this. And I'll say a bit more about that. Now, the waves carry energy, and one can get the luminosity by the rate of uh, the time change, uh, um, rate of uh, change of energy with time. And that gives us the third um, derivative of the quadrupolar moment to the squared power and the c to the 5. So this is a remarkable thing, which is that the this, this strain amplitude is tiny because you have c to the 4th in the denominator, but the luminosity is enormous because you have a c to the 5 in the, in the numerator. And these q double dot and triple dot terms are, are usually terms which we treat in, to be of order unity for most purposes. So, what might be astrophysical sources of gravitational waves then? Well, we already talked about the luminosity, which I have now just plugged in for Q double dot. I just I think, think of it as, uh, as a um, uh, scaling with the size of the object. And so what we see is that the luminosity has this convenient c to the fifth power um, in, in the numerator. It scales with the size of the object uh, compared to the Schwarzschild radius to the squared uh, and then the uh, velocity uh, as a relative to the speed of light to the sixth power. Did we? Oh, okay. Um, good. Um, so the sources of gravitational need, waves need to be compact. We need them to have a scaling of order the Schwarzschild radius for this number to be, uh, to be large, and they need to be relativistic. <coughs> Okay, and that really means that we're looking at neutron stars and black holes, and not just neutron stars and black holes that sit around, but ones that are rapidly accelerating. So they involve orbits, collisions, explosions. So those are the two ingredients that we need. We need massive quant compact objects, and we need rapid accelerations to, to have strong emitters of gravitational waves. So, of course, we think about things like uh, uh, colliding compact stars, like binary neutron stars and black holes that, that are merging. Uh, one can also think about uh, supernovae, which, uh, as, uh, as these uh, um, stars reach the end of their lives. Uh, and, of course, the Big Bang itself. And I'll come back to, uh, to these uh, uh, in short order. So, and, of course, there's also things we haven't thought about. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of history, sort of in the spirit of, of, of you know, the 100th anniversary of GR. Um, so certainly I already told you gravitational radiation was first in introduced in his 1916 paper, in the original one, uh, but it didn't get it right the first time. So he actually, uh, in a subsequent paper in 1918, he got the first correct formulation, and the big mistake there initially was that he didn't recognize that it was, its lowest moment was quadrupolar. Okay, then in, he himself really remained very uncertain. I mean, not just of how, how immeasurably weak this, the effect was, but also uh, of their very existence. And then he submitted actually a retraction paper uh, in a paper with Rosen in 1937. And this is the same Rosen of EPR. So somebody asked earlier, what, what, how is Einstein dividing up his time? So even as he was thinking about EPR with Rosen, they were also working on gravitational things. Now, he retracted the retraction. 
um, after a discussion with uh, Infeld and, and Robertson, and I write discussion, discussion in quotes here because it was actually uh, through a, a review process with, for physical review that, that Robertson came back and said, no, this is not right, take it away. Uh, and then finally, the uh, doubts and controversy subsided sort of uh, after a, a, a couple of decades, actually, uh, in 1957. But as an experimentalist, I can say this with, with great certainty, that experiment and observation have the final say, as usual. And that came in, in to the, the first time that came to us was in one of the finest discoveries of, of the 20th century. And I, I'm sort of embarrassed to put this up here with Joe in the room. But, uh, uh, but this was the, the, the uh, discovery of a binary neutron star system where one of the two neutron stars was a, uh, was a, uh, a pulsar. And this was discovered by Joe Taylor and Russell Hulse in 1974. And what this was, was it was actually a, a binary system that was relativistic enough that by measuring the, uh, the decay of the orbital period over some number of years, as you can see on this plot, this goes from 1974 out to uh, 2005, and since then even more points have been ha added. What they were able to show uh, is, is that the orbital period is decaying, this pair of neutron stars is getting closer to each other as it loses energy that's carried away by the gravitational radiation. And in fact, this, the solid line here was the exact prediction uh, by Giard is not a fit. And so this was a, a, a definitive evidence that gravitational waves are out there and that they behave uh, in, in the way that uh, Einstein's general relativity has predicted to us to first order. Uh, greatly impressed Sweden, and Joe went to uh, uh, Stockholm in 1993 for the Nobel Prize. So now, let's uh, look a little bit at the strength of the gravitational wave. So what you see here is this is, the, again, just a, a rewritten formula for strain where I've replaced the Q double dot term with just a scaling that goes as mr squared to the, uh, to the, the period uh, squared. So mr squared is just the moment of inertia, and the period squared is just a scaling for the second time derivative. I can turn that into a frequency if I like. And I can plug in numbers for a typical binary neutron star system at the end, end of its uh, uh, lifetime, which would be for the Hulse-Taylor binary about 100 million years from now. And what we see is that that particular system, which was in our own galaxy about 21,000 light years away, we would get a strain of 10 to the minus 18. Now, if you took such a, a binary system and you put it uh, in, in the Virgo cluster, which is 50 million light years away, or 15 megaparsecs in astronomers speak, that would become a strain of 10 to the minus 21. So these are small numbers, and you can now appreciate why Einstein was so pessimistic about this. Recall that this was in 1918. We did not know about neutron stars and black holes. We all, I mean, people knew at the time that there were binary stars, but you make numbers for those and that would really seem impossible. So this already seems like a small number, but I mostly, I tell my undergraduates always it's a dimensionless number. We can't really make much out of it till we put some dimensions on it. And those will come when we look at how we uh, are going to detect these. So what are some of the big questions that gravitational wave astrophysics can ask and, and seek to answer? So some, it starts with general relativity. And the first question one can ask is what does strong field gravity look like? What, is, what does gravity look like when you can't go to these linearized uh, metrics or, or small perturbations thereabouts near, near a pair of, of merging black holes or neutron stars, for example? Is general relativity the correct theory of gravity? Does the, do all astrophysical systems follow it? Do the predictions of quant canonical quantization hold, which is basically are the waves consistent with the field that has spin two uh, and, and zero uh, rest mass? And this is encapsulated in this, this little graphic here where we're, what we're seeing is the predicted strain amplitude as a function of time from a binary, um, compact binary merger, where you see a characteristic chirp as these two stars get closer to each other, the gravitational radiation, the amplitude increases, the frequency increases as the orbit is shrinking, and finally, you get a whole bunch of hash here uh, as they merge. And now, as the objects merge and then they sphericize, and so no more quadrupolar moment, you get the sort of a ring down and then the radiation sh turns off. 
the source turns off. And so, so this is the region, this hashy region here, which has been of much interest for, say, strong field gravity, which is what does the merger actually, uh, phase actually look like, and in fact was only uh, calculated in full numerical form in the last decade or so. Okay. Other big questions one might ask are about neutron stars. What are their equations of state? What is their maximum mass? What is the structure? What is the population of neutron stars? And let me put in a plug for, uh, uh, for Vicki Caspi's talk later today. She'll talk a lot more about neutron stars. I'm simply going to tell you they're there and they have interesting properties that we would love to know about. Uh, similarly with black holes, what is the population of black holes uh, with different masses? Do they exist in binaries? How do they form? How do they die? How does nature grow a supermassive black hole? Are these characterized by mass and spin only? Do they have hair? Um, can we black, uh, map black hole spacetimes, which comes right back to the question of what does strong field gravity look like? And so these are some of the questions that can be asked using gravitational radiation from such sources. And again, uh, we will talk a great deal uh, about black holes tomorrow, so uh, stay tuned for that part. Now there are some bigger and harder questions one can ask, which are not so clear that can be answered with just this present, our present uh, uh, sensitivity of detectors, uh, but one of them is, of course, about core collapse supernovae. So what are the explosion mechanisms for these? Now, part of the, 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 the beauty of gravitational radiation compared to most of astrophysics that's done with electromagnetic radiation is that the gravitational waves are actually uh, uh, very aloof. They do not interact very much with matter. So in, when they escape, they escape a source, they start streaming out of a source much, more, uh, much earlier in time than does uh, the, the light that brings us information about it. So for example, in the case of a core collapse supernova, one would expect that the gravitational radiation actually comes to us at, the, at, at an earlier point in time, which lets us probe the actual exp, uh, explosion uh, mechanism and the structure and dynamics inside of that progenitor, uh, which is completely shrouded uh, when we're looking at it with light, uh, what's going on deep inside the core. Now, similar arguments can be used also for looking for a truly primordial gravitational wave background uh, for the same reasons that we all know and, know, and you know, nowhere known better than here at Princeton, uh, the cosmic microwave background as a surface of last scattering is information that we get at when the universe was about 400,000 years old. Now, if we want to be able to probe the universe at earlier times uh, than that, we have to rely on, on, on an, uh, another a messenger, and that would be a gravitational wave, for the same reason that those have been streaming out towards us from the very earliest moments after the Big Bang. And the questions to be asked are really what can we learn about phase transitions and, and inflation and cosmic strings in that very early universe. Okay, and then there's the questions we don't yet know how to ask. And I'll leave that to your imagination. <laughs> so. so here is a, 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 a nice graphic of the gravitational wave spectrum. Just as when we think about light, we think about this, the whole spectrum from radio waves down to, to gamma rays. Similarly, one can think about the spectrum of gravitational waves starting from very, very uh, uh, long periods or low frequencies and then scanning all the way out, so f starting with periods that are at the age of the universe to periods of, of milliseconds or faster. And what I've done on this slide here is try to depict for you that in each of these sort of frequency bands, if you wi wish, or, or period uh, of, of the uh, gravitational radiation, we have certain techniques that are, are available for probing the gravitational radiation on those, at, at those frequencies. And so starting with the very lowest frequencies that, uh, 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 that are uh, around 10 to the minus 16 or so hertz, uh, what we uh, have are the gravitational waves that are imprinted onto the cosmic microwave background. And the uh, experiments that as, as the ones we heard about last, last year, uh, like BICEP and, and many others that I'll talk about in a bit, are, have, have possibly the ability to measure the, this, the gravitational uh, wave background uh, as it's imprinted on the polarization of the cosmic microwave uh, background. Okay? Now, in the nanohertz range, 
uh, right ar ar around on the time scale of, of, of years. Uh, one can also look for gravitational waves in those frequency range uh, by looking uh, at uh, pulsar timing. And pulsar timing arrays are, are, a, are, are a tool for looking at, at gravitational waves where the principle is, again, very much that you can time the, the emission from a pulsar. Pulsars are exquisitely good clocks. And if the space between the pulsar and the observer, in this case us, is uh, if a gravitational wave goes, passes through that region of space, that will perturb the, the, uh, the timing of the pulsar clock, and we should be able to measure that here on the Earth. And, uh, and so that's another technique that's, that's available and being exploited. Now, in terms of, of sources, um, that where we, ex what, do, what kinds of sources would we expect at each of these frequencies? Well, certainly for the, the truly primordial background, we're looking at, we're thinking about uh, quantum fluctuations in the very early universe. By the time we're looking at these, at gravitational waves that have, have periods of years to hours, one is thinking about very, very massive uh, 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 black hole systems, such as the supermassive black holes in the centers of, of galaxies. And so when we get down to this region of, of, of instead of nanohertz, getting down to sort of the millihertz uh, region, uh, one can also, one can look for these gravitational waves using interferometers in space. And then finally, nearest and dearest to, to my heart, uh, are the terrestrial interferometers, which are the experiments going on, uh, on, on terra firma. And these have their best sensitivity around the 100 hertz band, and so they are typically looking for, uh, for neutron stars, binary neutron stars and, and black holes uh, that are not too massive, things that can, can actually uh, undergo motions at uh, you know, uh, on millisecond time scales. Okay, so let me now switch gears. I've said a little bit about gravitational waves and the sources and what are the things we might be able to learn about the universe if we can directly observe these. And so let me now talk a little bit about how we go about observing these. And I will focus in entirely on, uh, for this part of my talk, on terrestrial um, uh, interferometric detectors. So the principle is really, really uh, simple. A gravitational wave stretches the space time intervals between freely floating objects. If I have a laser and at some distance away I have a mirror and I reflect that laser light off of the mirror and I have a really good clock, I measure the light travel time and I can tell what the space-time distance is. If a gravitational wave comes by and, and, and modulates that space-time distance, the timing on my clock will modulate and I have a measurement. Now that's a simple principle. It turns out that we don't have clocks that are good enough by many, many orders of magnitude. So we make the, the experiment a little bit uh, uh, more complex. Instead of using a single laser beam, we use an interferometer, which you can just think of as, as two laser beams. So there's a beam splitter right here that splits the light in two halves. The light reflects off of each of these mirrors and recombines at the output here. And we can measure the interference pattern of the light in this path compared to this path to construct the path length difference. And that works out much, much better. You don't need an absolute clock for that. This is a relative measurement. A way to, one way to think of it is that you, uh, you use one arm as, the, as your clock reference and the other arm as your measurement. Uh, but that makes, uh, makes it feasible to do. So we have two tasks then to really make a, a, a working gravitational wave detector. The first thing we have to do is we have to make our mirrors very, very still. Okay, so I'll tell you how still. Let me just put a, 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 a scale on it. I've told you that if we had a neutron star binary sitting out somewhere in the, in the Virgo cluster, it has a strain amplitude of 10 to the minus 21. Now if that wave were passing through me, I'm a space-time object of order of length one meter. It would modulate my height by a 10 to the minus 21 meters. So that's, that's really, really small. Uh, it turns out we, we're not quite so foolish as to use an object like me uh, uh, for a detector. What we do is we try to make the spacing between the lasers and the mirrors as large as, as possible. And so in the case of most ter terrestrial uh, observatories that I'll show you, those are kilometer scales. Now you scale that up, 10 to the minus 21 is the strain times the length of your detector is kilometers. 
uh, and that gives you a change in length of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So really what you have to do is you have to make your mirrors more still than 10 to the minus 18 meters if you want it to respond, its motion to respond only to a gravitational wave, okay? And that's doable but hard. So you have to do a lot of vibration isolation and thermal fluctuation control. Now, it's kind of useless if you made this perfectly still mirror. It's so pristinely still. If you don't have a means of measuring those tiny motions, and therein enters uh, the laser light. The laser light you can think of is our meter stick. It is, it's the wavelength of the laser that we reference as the, the, the gradations on our, on our ruler for measuring these small motions. And therein enters Einstein's second nemesis, which is that the quantization of the light and the quantum fluctuations of, uh, of, of the electromagnetic vacuum are going to come bite us in, in a while, okay? Okay, so there's a global network of detectors. There's, um, there are, uh, there's uh, the, the two that, that, that I will focus on most are the LIGO detectors, which is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Uh, there's two uh, observatories, one in, um, uh, Washington State, just east of Seattle, and another one in Louisiana, sort of halfway between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And these are four kilometer long detectors. Now, across uh, the, the pond in Europe, there is the, uh, a three kilometer long detector in Italy called Virgo. And uh, nearby in Germany, there is a small little 600 meter long detector, Geo. And then under construction at the, at, at the present time, is a, an underground detector, a three kilometer long detector in Japan, in the, uh, sharing the same mountain as the Ka uh, Kamiokande experiment, so in the Kamioka mine being constructed at the moment. And then there are a couple of, play, uh, of, of pointers to potential future detectors. One is a detector in India, which I'll say a, a bit more about later. And then possibly the ones with question marks are very futuristic. There, is, there are dreams, but not, not really plans or funds for them. So in, uh, in Australia, and then of course, many of you have known of LISA, which is the, the space interferometer, which is also a big question mark because it at the present time remains unfunded. Okay, so let me give you a little tour of the observatory. Uh, so this happens to be our, our Louisiana observatory, and you can tell because it's, it's in the middle of a, uh, of a, of a forest. Uh, so in the central building resides the lasers and a whole bunch of other optics, and then four kilometers down at the ends, at each end, are the mirrors that reflect the laser beams back to the center where all the measurements are made. The laser beams, and so the length, I'll remind you, is we're trying to get to, to uh, 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 a measurement of 10 to the minus 18 meters. The laser beams move uh, inside of these beam tubes, which are uh, held under ultra-high vacuum and, uh, and uh, propagate for four kilometers and uh, reflect off a mirror and return back. The beam tubes are, are, are protected by beam tube enclosures, which are these, these strange-looking uh, objects, uh, concrete objects here, uh, strange as they look. They have a utility. Uh, so this is not a Photoshop <laughs> photo. This is now at our Washington Observatory, and you can tell because it's in the high desert east of Seattle. And along comes a patrol car over this dune and simply uh, overlooks that there's this four kilometer long barrier in the middle of the desert, okay? So no one was hurt, but uh, if you go inside of the central building, you see objects like you see objects like, like these. These are the, the vacuum chambers uh, that hold the mirrors of the interferometer. Now, to put a size scale on it, if I stand beside one of these myself, the top of my head reaches just below this row of viewports. Now, why do you need such big chambers? Well, it turns out that the mirrors of LIGO are themselves not, not small. They are about uh, 25 to 35 centimeters in diameter, and, and that's motivated by many things. But the simplest one of all, of course, is if you take a simple laser beam and you propagate it for four kilometers, the diffraction limited spot is pretty big. So you need a big mirror to catch all your light. And then, of course, the mirror itself is then, uh, 
sitting on top of an enormous uh, set of vibration isolation systems. This is just one example of them where you have a spring mass system which acts as a passive vibration isolation system, very much like the shock absorbers in your, uh, in your car. Okay? And sitting on top of that kind of vibration isolation platform is a, a, a mirror. This is a mirror from from a previous version of LIGO, so it's about 28 centimeters in diameter. And what you can't really see in this picture, but it's true, is that the mirror itself is hanging as a pendulum. And most of you learned in, 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 in your early physics training that above the resonant frequency, uh, of, above the natural frequency of, of the pendulum, uh, it acts as a natural filter. So if I take the top of, of a, a, a mass that's hanging on a string, and I, sh I shake it at frequencies much above the resonant frequency. I can do a lot of shaking, but the bottom doesn't move. And you can try this in your rooms tonight. <laughs> okay, so these are, are, are suspended to, uh, as, uh, to act as, as further vibration filters. And here's just a zoom in of the, of, of the, of the, mir of the mirror, and here is uh, a laser from uh, initial LIGO. Here is the control room that controls all the, all the um, uh, operations of these detectors. Now, when you put this all together, you get a, a, um, a spectrum like this one. So this is a spectrum where we have frequency on the horizontal axis. And notice that it goes from 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz. So that's the human audio band. So, and it has its minimum right around 100 hertz. That's the place where we are most sensitive to gravitational waves. And then on the vertical axis, we have the spectral density of strain. So it simply says that if we have a gravitational wave that is, has strain larger than this, this set of curves here, it would be detectable. And if it's smaller, we would uh, have a hard time seeing it. Now, the red curve is the target sensitivity for the first phase of LIGO, which ran from about 2000 to, to 2010. And the blue and green curves are the sensitivities that were achieved in 2007 and 2010, uh, respectively. The lowest part of this curve is limited by the seismic noise. So our Earth is actually a really vibrating, vibrant place. And so uh, despite all of our, our, our good filtering and uh, vi uh, vibration isolation systems, this was the best that could be achieved on those in that first phase. So this is limited by the remaining vibrations of the Earth coupling through to the motion of the mirrors. At intermediate frequencies, or this, this part of the curve here, is due to thermal noise. And that's really just to the fact that the mirrors are sitting at room temperature, and in each degree of freedom, they have KT of energy that's being dis that can be dissipated into the, the motion of the mirror. So it's moving due to that. And then finally, at the highest <laughs> frequencies here, at this part of the curve, is due to the quantization of the light. So this is called, this is the shot noise limit, and this simply comes from the fact that we have quantum uncertainty in the number of photons uh, uh, that we measure on our detectors, okay? That, uh, that's probing the position of the mirrors. Now, there's something else that I really love about this, this uh, red curve here, which was that it was written down by this guy. This is Ray Weiss. Uh, and Ray Weiss actually calculated this curve in 1972. And so I want to just remind people, so the red curve was, was initially calculated in 1972. Factors of two came and went, but they mostly, it mostly stayed the same. And then the blue curve was, was realized in 2007 and the green curve in 2010. So this is not an enterprise for people in a hurry. Okay, when you do all of that and you make such an exquisite detector, what can it do for you? And so this first phase of LIGO that ran, in, as I said, from 2000 to 2010, but in this 2007 time frame, it, well, there was, there was some, of, some extended uh, observing runs. And it turns out that on, the, on the February 1st, 2007, so on the first day of the second month of the seventh year of this century, uh, there was a very luminous gamma ray burst, and it was uh, both luminous and also very close by. So it was detected by a number of gamma ray uh, observatories like SWIFT and Integral and others, who were able to constrain its location as being consistent with being in, in, in the Andromeda galaxy, in M31. Now, it turns out that the leading model for these short 
duration, very hard spectrum gamma ray bursts is believed to be that these are the, the merge, mergers of, of binary neutron star or black hole systems. So the idea is that these same systems like the Hulse-Taylor binary system towards the end of their lives when they, when they, when they merge are, are giving off this, this intense gamma uh, radiation. LIGO was on the air at the time that this, this gamma ray burst occurred, that both LIGO detectors were. So we, of course, looked for a signal with the LIGO detectors, and we found actually no plausible signal. And what that allowed us to say with nine, greater than 99% confidence was that this particular gamma ray burst was not caused by a compact binary star merger in M31. And this led to a whole set of follow-up uh, observations where it was concluded that it was most likely a soft gamma repeater or giant flare in M31 and not actually uh, a short hard burst. So here's an example of what you can do even in the absence of signal if you have a, a, a well-built detector. But of course, we couldn't just stop there. There have been no direct detections with this first generation of detectors. And so, of course, we set about um, a decade earlier already by sort of the late 1990s to early 2000s designing and planning for the second generation uh, detector. And the astrophysical motivations were also quite profound. So the first phase of LIGO is called initial LIGO. And I'll only draw your attention to this central column. What am I showing in this, in this uh, table here? That comes from a, 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 a paper which, was, uh, which, which attempted to estimate the rates at which binary systems uh, could, uh, could give us signal in our detector. So for initial LIGO, if you just look at the neutron star, neutron star binaries, the, the, so there's a low rate, a high rate, and the n dot sub re simply means realistic. So we kind of said, what's, the, what's really realistic? Now, why is there such a, a, a wide span, three orders of magnitude between the highest predicted rates and the lowest ones? It's simply that these are based on population models that have very few inputs. We only know of a handful of, of these relativistic binaries that, from which we have to extrapolate what are, what's the binary population in the rest of the universe. So that's part of why it's, it's hard. But if you took these realistic rates, you would, you would see that our chance of seeing a neutron star, neutron star binary in initial LIGO was 0.02 per year. Okay? So, and in, indeed, it's consistent with seeing nothing. Now, if we go to the next generation detectors, which I'll describe in a moment, which is advanced LIGO, we immediately, that number jumps up to 40 per year in the, in the realistic case, okay? So that was the motivation that you really, if you could build a detector that had a factor of 10 better amplitude sensitivity, which means a factor, uh, which means that the rate goes up by the cube of the, the, the sensitivity improvement, so a factor of 1,000, uh, you could actually do, really start to have very, very, um, like, very large likelihood that there would be signals to be seen. So the idea was to keep the same infrastructure, the same observatories, the same buildings, but to re replace everything that's inside the vacuum system and to expect to be observing about a thousand times more galaxies. So a thousand times is just the, 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 the rate uh, by 2018. That was the goal and the motivations. And in, in fact, the first thing you have to ask is, can, is that even possible to do? And so this is a, a plot, again, strain on the vertical axis versus frequency on the horizontal axis. And the red curve is the target sensitivity of initial LIGO. And the blue curve, which is made up of many other curves, is the limit at which the LIGO facilities can operate. And you can see there are several orders of magnitude in between the two for making detector improvements before you throw out the facility, right? And so, of course, it, was, it behooves us to fill this in. Now, let me make one other comment whilst I'm, I'm, I'm here on this part, which is just to say this lowest frequency part right here is, is something called gravity gradient noise, which is basically to do with the fact that local gravity ha is, is varying with time here on the Earth and could be due to any number of things, from a seismic wave running underground to a cloud passing by overhead. And, in fact, this is the reason why it would be very, very hard, if not impossible, to make a very low frequency detector on the Earth, and in fact, we have to get off the planet, and it motivates the space detectors, okay? But in any case, it's possible on the Earth to still do a lot in this gap right here, and indeed, that's what, was, that's what we're doing now. So advanced LIGO is the second generation of the LIGO detectors, and it is um, 
Uh, here is the black curve is the target sensitivity uh, for advanced LIGO. And it's achieved really, you'll, you'll be very disappointed by what I'm about to say, but I'm not going to go into the details. You're welcome to ask me later. It's achieved by getting better seismic isolation at low frequencies. It, you get better mirrors and suspensions, so your thermal noise goes down at these intermediate frequencies. And finally, at the high frequencies where you're limited by the f uncertainty in the number of photons, you just get more photons, and so you get higher laser power. Now, remarkably, when you do all of those things, this black curve is entirely limited by the quantum vacuum fluctuations. And I'll go to the, into that in just a couple of, in, in, in a few minutes, okay? So advanced LIGO construction is, is now complete. Here are the, the, the better uh, uh, suspension systems, better vib vibration isolation systems, uh, bigger laser. And here is where we're at as of uh, early October this year. So advanced LIGO has begun its first observing run that began on, on September 18th. And it has a sensitivity. Here are the two uh, uh, instruments for advanced LIGO, so the, the Washington and Louisiana w ones. And in this region, in the most sensitive region here, these instruments are about three times better than, than the previous generation of detectors. And so the plan is to, to ha have this first observing run go until middle of January 2016. And then we close down again for further upgrades. So this is a factor of three better than the previous generation of, of, of initial LIGO and a factor of three away from the target sensitivity. So there's still much work to be done, and that's the work that's going to go on in the next two years or so to get up to target sensitivity. But there's an observing run that's going on right now. And that observing run is going pretty well. So I'll just put out a few uh, figures of merit. In initial LIGO, we, we, a figure of merit that we like to use in this field is how, to what distance could you see a 1.4 solar mass neutron star binary that's averaged over all positions in the sky and all inclination or uh, angles of the binary. And that's something we, we, ca we call the in-spiral range. And so what you can see is here is the week-by-week -week play of the last few weeks of the run where both detectors have been mostly running at an in-spiral range that's around uh, between 60 and 80 megaparsecs. Recall that initial LIGO was around 15 to 18 megaparsecs, so that's, a, that's a much further out uh, than, than, than we've had before. And they're also running with a pretty good uh, duty factor, which is that in order to, to to ha collect data that's scientifically reliable, both the detectors have to be uh, running in, in high sensitivity mode at the same time, and that's what this green part of the pie chart is, which is the double, double coincidence for the, the LIGO network, and that's around 46%. So these are all really, by, uh, for us, very uh, encouraging um, benchmarks for this observing run. Okay, so this global network of detectors, which I already described to you, what, what's it here for and why do we have so many of these two LIGOs, one Virgo, eventually Kagra, and, and maybe uh, a detector in India as well? Well, it all boils down to the fact that each of these detectors, here is the L shape of the detectors, each of them has, has, uh, uh, does not have uh, much ability to localize on the sky. What you see here is that this, the angular response is nearly quadrupolar, which means it's an omnidirectional detector. It has greater sensitivity, uh, you know, uh, uh, normal to the plane, and no sensitivity along the arms, but it's pretty, it's a cosine squared function, so it's pretty uh, omnidirectional. And so if we are to pinpoint the location of sources in the sky, we have to actually do that by triangulation, and that uh, our ability to do that depends on the number of detectors in the network and the signal-to-noise ratio of the events that they measure. And so that's part of why we have this whole global network of detectors, and I'll just show you a quick visual of what you can do when you have a network of detectors. So here is these. Uh, the, here is a map of the sky, and each of these funny ellipses, or bananas as we like to call them, 
are basically the error bar, bar on how well you could localize one of these neutron star uh, binaries in each direction that you look at. And you can see in some directions they are better localized because of the orientation of the detectors and their sensi ex highest sensitivities line up. And in other places like here, you, it's very poorly uh, localized. And this is, this is actually the, uh, the prediction for when LIGO and Virgo are both running in their advanced detector sens uh, target sensitivities. Now, if you then add a third detector that's spatially well separated, like a detector in India, uh, so uh, if you would put one of the, the, so this is the same map with the two detectors in the, in the US, two LIGO detectors, Virgo in Europe, and a LIGO detector in India, and you can see that the error boxes get much smaller. Now, if you're an astronomer who wants to go and follow up a gravitational wave signal with your telescope, and the gravitational wave community tells you it's kind of over there in that 100 square degree patch, you're not gonna, you're gonna laugh at us, and they do. And so this is the, the motivations for these, for a global network is, 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 is very um, uh, much on our minds, and in fact, what's pushing the possibility of putting a LIGO detector in India. So just quickly, this is what it looks like with uh, without uh, India, and here it is with India, okay? So localizations get better. All right, so let me just say really quickly what, what's going on with the other uh, remaining detectors. So there's uh, Advanced Virgo, and Advanced Virgo, the upshot of Advanced Virgo, which is also going through a big upgrade phase, is that they, they hope to be able to join uh, the LIGO network using the second observing run, which will be uh, pr uh, presumably sometime in late 2016. Okay, maybe 2017. So Advanced Virgo is, is sort of just finishing the, the, their construction and integration phase and are starting to begin commissioning. Kagura, which is the Japanese uh, uh, three kilometer detector in the Kamioka uh, mine is completing uh, a, its first phase, which is a very simplified uh, phase with, uh, 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 but I, I think what's important to see here is that it, they've made enormous progress. Here is actually a picture of the beam tubes in the tunnel in the Kamioka mine. So the L-shaped tunnels are done, the beam tubes are in, and laser beams should be shooting back and forth uh, pretty quickly. You can see this picture looks pretty wet. They've had a lot of problem with flooding inside the tunnels from, uh, 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 but um, uh, it's going well. Now in, in sort of two years from now time frame, they hope to be at sort of operating at their final sensitivity, including cryogenic operation. So this is the first detector where they're attempting to actually cool the mirrors. So I've told you thermal noise is a problem, and one of the ways that you can address that is, of course, to cool the mirrors. Now, most people who work with cryogenics know that a low vibration environment and a cryogenic environment are, are, are a disaster together. And so this is a very heroic attempt to try to, to make that work. And I actually predict it's going to be a pathfinder for future detectors as, uh, as we go forward. LIGO India is a, is a third LIGO interferometer that's pla uh, that we're hoping to install in a facility in India with the arrangement that the, the, the US provides the detector and India provides the facilities and, and, uh, and operations. And it's at the phase where it's been proposed, it's gone far through the, the, the approval process and is waiting for final approval from, from the Indian government. And this is just a little plot that shows that the site selection process is also well underway. And if things go as planned, then it should join the global network in 2022. Okay, so if we look to the future beyond advanced LIGO, what do we have? Well, I think that uh, you should really just think about plans, dreams, wild speculation as you go down this list, which is in the near term, we have very clear paths to, to how we're gonna gain. Some gains are made just by upgrades we know how to make in advanced LIGO and Virgo. Some gains will be made by Kagra and LIGO India joining the network. And then beyond that, there are, there are, there are curves that I can show you about what we might do, but I won't spend any time telling you what they are because like I said, at the moment, they're you know, very, uh, very preliminary. But the idea is that the community is thinking about what happens when you, when you um, uh, want to do better than the advanced LIGO, advanced detector thing. And that brings me to the very last part of my talk, which is I told you already that advanced LIGO is limited by the vacuum fluctuations, by the quantum vacuum. So you might already be asking, what do they, what do they think they can do that's, that's better? 
And so let me show you what the problems are. So this is my, my last bit, which is Einstein's other struggle. And here, this is the part of my talk where quantum engineering actually meets the gravitational wave experiment. And so I begin, oh, did I miss something? Okay, ah, this, that's cool. Okay, so let's, let's look at what limits uh, uh, advanced LIGO's sensitivity here. So I told you that what happened is we increased the laser power and so we get a stronger measurement. So what happens in this region where we're limited by our ability to count enough photons accurately, we get an improvement. So this curve goes down because we have more laser power. The noise scales, the, the, the shot noise or the quantum noise scales as the square root of the number of photons whereas the signal scales as the number of photons. So you win by the square root of the number of photons in signal to noise, and that's exactly as promised. Now what happens here is something that's uh, uh, actually very much driven by the quantum fluctuations, but a completely classical effect, which is that light carries momentum. And what happened here is now you have all of these photons that are streaming and hitting your mirror, they're imparting momentum to the mirror and kicking the mirror. So what you have there is this, the, the, a, a, a well-known problem in, in quantum measurement science, which is that as you increase your laser power, you made a stronger measurement, but as you made the stronger measurement, that measurement has a back action on, on, uh, on the measurement process itself. And so here, this part of the curve is completely limited by the vacuum fluctuations that are buffeting the mirrors. Now, Imagine what Einstein would think of that. Spooky as hell, right? There's vacuum fluctuations that are actually causing our mirrors to be uh, uh, motion uh, positions to fluctuate. So what can we do about that? I'm actually going to, in the interest of time, go through this a little bit quickly. What we know how to do is we know how to engineer quantum states of light. So let me just tell you where, how do the vacuum fluctuations get into the interferometer? So I have a laser, and imagine I have the, a perfect interferometer, so half the light goes in each arm, and then I arrange these path lengths so I get perfect destructive interference at the output here. Perfect destructive interference means it's dark. Where does the laser light go? Well, energy must be conserved. It goes back towards the laser. Now, if I had noise on the laser, if I had fluctuations on the laser, where do those go? They have to obey the same beam splitter rules and, and inference rules as the light, so they go back towards the laser. So you would argue that out here I could make a perfect <coughs> measurement. And the answer is that's only true in the classical world. In the quantum optics world, when you have an open port in a quantum system, what streams in? The quantum vacuum. And that's exactly what happens here. In this open port, we get the quantum vacuum streaming in, and by the same symmetries that cause the laser light to go back towards the laser, the quantum vacuum comes back out on this port of the beam splitter. Now imagine what you have here. So in, in, this is, in phasor space, you can just think of these as, as diagrams, as, uh, as, as pictures of amplitude and phase of the light, and so you can see that there's quantum uncertainty. We can't know, know that perfectly well. The little yellow phaser is the bit of laser light that came out here when a gravitational wave comes by and you get some uh, deviation from perfect destructive interference. As soon as that light comes out, it interferes with this, this quantum uncertainty and that gives rise to the, the shot noise. That's where it comes from. This was one of the er important uh, uh, discoveries of the late 1970s and 1980s and this is due to Carl Caves. Now imagine you can engineer a quantum state of light uh, so let me just add, by the way, that the radiation pressure, this buffeting of the mirrors over here, comes from the same effect, which is that the, these vacuum fluctuations uh, superpose with the, the bright fields here and buffet the mirrors, okay? Now, what if I could actually inject, instead of this norm, this coherent state, which is this equal uncertainty in both directions, a squeeze state. And the squeeze state is very carefully chosen. Notice that what I've done is all I've done is created a state where the area of my uncertainty ellipse is exactly the same as the area of my circle was before. Now, why do I have to do that? If I didn't, I would violate Heisenberg. 
but there's nothing. So Heisenberg simply says the product of these two uncertainties has to be greater than h bar, which means that in each, uh, uh, um, the area of, of, of the noise uncertainty has to remain the same. If I send this squeeze state into my interferometer, it'll come out at this output, and now notice that I actually got an improvement in my measurement. The, this, along my signal, I have less noise than I did before. Well, it turns out we know how to engineer such quantum states, and we were able to inject those into the initial LIGO detector in 2010. And so the red curve shows you what, uh, what we would have had without these specially engineered quantum, uh, uh, these uh, specially engineered squeezed vacuum states. That's just our standard sensitivity. And then the blue curve shows you what happened when we were able to inject these quantum engineered states into the interferometer where we saw a 25 dB, uh, a 25% improvement. And this experiment has led us to be believe that we now know how to take this advanced LIGO limit of the quantum vacuum, the quantum fluctuations, and use these carefully engineered states of light to do better. We don't violate Heisenberg, but we manipulate the hell out of it. All right, so let me just close by saying I think that this is the dawn of gravitational wave astrophysics. We have any number of, of experiments in CMB polarization coming, which we are all hoping we'll really see the, uh, uh, the uh, primordial gravitational wave background. Pulsar timing arrays are, are, are getting to better timing precision and more sources, so they too are, uh, are going to uh, give us uh, uh, valuable new information in the nanohertz region. Unclear when and if the space detectors will be resurrected, but, uh, but I certainly am hopeful. And then I think with LIGO, Virgo, and, and CAGRA coming on with better sensitivity, better theory, and sky localization, I think we're really at the cusp of being able to say we will be able to directly observe gravitational waves in, across the spectrum in the next decade or so. So I'll end there. <laughs>